that changes the course of history. If it were not for them, the message and the commemoration would not exist. They provided us with them. They told us the stories. They changed and created emotion in the people around them. So much so that a new battle occurred after Imam Hussein. Why would Imam Hussein take the women and children to Karbala with him? Karbala is a story of family who've come together to protect not just Imam Hussein, but to protect the monotheistic message from Adam to Hussein. Prior to Karbala, we see ladies like Dulham, like Um Wahab, encouraging their menfolk to stand with Imam Hussein alayhi salam, to join his caravan, to go and fight with him, to not be scared, reminding them of the Akhirah, of the Prophet. When Sayyidah Zainab was asked, how do you see what happened to you and your family? Sayyidah Zainab replies, I see nothing but beauty. The story of the women of Karbala begins with Umm Salama, one of the most pious wives of the Holy Prophet. In a hadith known as Hadith al qarura we see that Umm Salama had a deep connection with the story of Karbala long before its events transpired. Umm Salama, she lived until the time of Karbala and she was the only wife of the Prophet that actually lived until then. When Muawiyah used to curse Amir al-Mu'mineen on the Mambar after the Adhan. She sent a letter to Muawiyah dishonoring him and questioning him. How could you do something as terrible as that? And so she was never afraid of putting herself in a position in which she may be unsafe, but as long as the truth actually prevailed. And so in her own right, she was a woman of wisdom, a woman of loyalty to the point that Imam al-Hussein, when he was leaving to Karbala, he gave Umm Salama all of his possessions and all of his books, and he asked her to keep them safe. One of the things about Umm Salama that I think is most striking, that we often don't know about her, is her eloquence, her ability to be able to narrate. And she was a narrator of many of the hadiths of the Prophet himself, السلام, and of Fatima to Zahra as well. Oftentimes when we hear the stories of the Prophet and the interactions between the Prophet and the wives of the Prophet, we don't often hear the full history of those wives and the pivotal roles that they played. Umm Salama was trusted by the Prophet, trusted so much so that he foretold the future of Ahlul Bayt and he gave her that trust in the form of the earth. He literally gave her earth, the dirt. And he foretold Umm Salama, there will come a day when you will see that this earth has turned to the color of blood or blood itself. You should know that at that point in time, my son, my grandson Hussein, has been martyred. Both Shi'i and Sunni sources mention these ahadith with slight variations between them that um, Umm Salama, once the Prophet was at her house when an angel visited him and it was either the angel of rain or angel Jibra'il alayhi salam and as Imam Hussein alayhi salam entered and ran to his grandfather they said do you want to know how this boy whom you love so much is going to be killed, the fact that he's going to be killed by your ummah. The angel brought him some soil, some red soil, from the land of Karbala and the Prophet wept. Umm Salama put that soil in a glass container and tied it to her veil. And the word for that glass container is Qarura, and that's why it's known as Hadith al-Qarura. After the Prophet wasallam had passed away, Umm Salama saw him in a dream and she woke up crying. And when they asked her why she was crying, she said she had seen the Prophet with dust on his hair and in his beard 
and he said, I have just witnessed the killing of my grandson. After the departure of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, she would keep looking at that qarura every hour or so, um, you know, to, to check it. And when he had been killed, that that sand was then bloodied. Firstly, when we look at Imam Hussein alayhi salam's own statement of why he went to Karbala, he says, إِنِّي لَمْ أَخْرُجْ أَشِرًا وَلَا بَطِرًا وَلَا مُفْسِدًا وَلَا ظَالِمًا وَإِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِصْلَاحَ فِي أُمَّةِ جَدِّي His motive for going, for leaving Medina, was not to be a troublemaker or a rebel or a wrongdoer or mischief monger, right? It was there because he sought reform in the community of his grandfather. So it makes sense that he would want to include his women and children in those noble endeavors. Secondly, he was leaving Medina because there was a threat to his life. He was being sought out to seek to pay allegiance to Yazid or else be killed. So if Medina had become a dangerous place for him, so was it a dangerous place for his women and children. There's no way that he would have left them there. Thirdly, in that society where oral tradition was so common, where eyewitnesses were paramount, it makes sense that you took your women and children along because they would be the narrators, they would be the eyewitnesses of what had happened, knowing the brutality of that regime of the time and that they would probably leave no male standing from the family of the Prophet. It was also a strategic move to expose just how bad Yazid's government was, that they would not leave the women and children unharmed. Why would Imam Hussein take the women and children to Karbala with him? Why would he put them in harm's way? And the answer to that is Karbala is not just a story of women and children. Karbala is a story of family. It's a story of a core unit of friends and family who've come together to protect, not just Imam Hussein, but to protect the monotheistic message from Adam to Hussein. He knew that the family would suffer. The family knew that they would suffer. But this is the elevation of acceptance of a divine will. And the women and children not are only part of the story of Karbala, they actually become the translators of the story of Karbala. Had this not happened, then perhaps we would not have had the story of Zainab and her courage. Had the women and children not been there, it would not have been the story of a father and his orphan daughter. It would not be the story of a brother and a sister. It would not be the story of a husband and a wife. It would not be the story that it is today. It paints a picture for any human being that has a human relationship, regardless if they're Muslim or non-Muslim, to understand the human elements, the pain, the suffering, and the victory over injustice. They were also very eloquent. They were also very committed to their faith. They were committed to the greater universal perspective of truth over falsehood. Sometimes God puts you where you belong. It doesn't mean that you have to accept, you still have the free will to turn away or to say no. But then there are those times where you may wonder why you're here and surrender to the idea that there is something that you are part of that is so far greater than who you are in that moment. And the women of Karbala had the intelligence and they had the insight to understand what their mission was. A name synonymous with the event of Karbala is the name of Ummul Banin. This great lady dedicated her life and her four sons to the service of the grandson of the Holy Prophet. It began with her marriage to the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Upon the demise of Lady Fatima alayhi salam, Imam Ali went to his brother Aqil and said, Aqil, find me a wife from a tribe that is known for their valor. So Aqil found a lady by the name of Fatima bint Hizam al-Kilabiyya who is known to be from 
a tribe of warriors, a tribe that was known for their stoicism. Fatima bint Hizam al-Kilabiya was married to Imam Ali alayhi salam. And when she bore him four sons, the first and foremost message that she instilled in these boys was that Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan, and Sayyidah Zainab were not just your siblings, but your leaders, and that their primary role was to protect them, to preserve the message of Islam, and to treat them with absolute respect and dignity. She comes from a heritage of warriors, but not just warriors who fight with the sword. We're talking about warriors who are noble in their mission, noble in their cause, noble in their fight against justice. Anyone can fight with a weapon in their hand. That's not what Umm al-Banin's heritage was about. It was deeper than that. When Fatima alayhi salatu salam dies, Umm Kalthum is a baby. She's a year, year and a half old. Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Zainab, they're, they're less than 13 years old. And here comes into the home of Fatima, not only a servant, and she called herself a servant. She said to those orphan children, I am not here to replace your mother. I am here to be your servant. Because she understood what it means to commit to the greater good of Islam. Before Imam Hussein reached Karbala, he sent his trusted emissary, Muslim ibn Aqi to the land of Kufa to gather promised support. Ultimately, he was betrayed and left stranded with no supporters to help him except one, a courageous woman by the name of Tawa. Tawa's husband used to work for Ibaidullah ibn Ziyad and her son Bilal also followed in his father's footsteps while she herself used to hold strong to the love for Ahl al-Bayt. It is said that she was once standing outside waiting for her son Bilal to come home. When a man walked by her home, Muslim ibn Aqil, he had lost an entire uh, nation, an entire tribe who had pledged their allegiance to him, thousands in numbers. He had no shelter, no water, nowhere to stay, no safety. And so he sent his salam and she replied with salam. He said, oh servant of God, I ask you for some water. And she provided him with water. Muslim and Aqil then humbly requested for him to stay in her home. She said, who are you? He said, I am Muslim ibn Aqil. The entire nation has left me stranded. She allowed him into the home and she provided him food that he did not touch. And she continuously visited him until her son suspected something. In the morning, he quickly went and informed the tyrants of this to which they came. We can see how someone can care so much for Ahl al-Bayt to the point that they fear nothing but the safety of the Ahl al-Bayt, the safety of their message. It's for this reason that Tawa rose to the occasion and is now immortalized on pulpits from across the world upon thousands and thousands of lectures that are given. Her name is immortalized and remembered as someone who is a defender of Imam al-Hussein's message and someone who truly allowed and supported the establishment of the true narrative of what happened at Karbala to take place. One of the many roles of the women of Karbala can be seen in how they encouraged their husbands to aid Imam Hussein on his mission. This can be clearly seen with Dulham, the wife of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. She was known as Dilham bint Amr, and she was the wife of Zuhair ibn Qayn. Now, Zuhair ibn Qayn was actually a Kufan army commander. He and his wife and their entourage were on the way back from Mecca to Kufa, and they were traveling kind of at the same time as Imam Hussein alayhi salam's caravan. So a man from his entourage actually narrates this, this incident, and he says that we were kind of neck and neck with him, but we didn't want to stop at the same places that Hussein ibn Ali stopped. So this man says that, you know, wherever he stopped, we would stop before them or we would go ahead of them. But it just so happened that at one place we were obliged to stop at the same place as Hussein's camp. And we pitched our tents opposite him. And a messenger from Hussein ibn Ali's camp came and said, Oh Zuhair ibn Qayn, Hussein ibn Ali is calling you. He mentions that Zuhair ibn Qayn wasn't particularly forthcoming and didn't want to go and meet Hussein ibn Ali. And it was his wife, Dulham, that said, 
the son of the messenger of Allah is calling you and you're not responding. He said, at least go and listen to what he has to say and then you can come back. It's amazing that it was her who encouraged her husband to stand up and go and answer the call. And the way she phrased it was the son of the messenger of Allah, that she had that much love and respect for the Prophet. So Zuhair ibn Qayn did go to meet Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And the narrator says that when he came back, he was invigorated. It was like he was a different man and he had a smile on his face and all the anxiety and confusion on his face had disappeared. He spoke to his wife and he released her from her marital duties. Some say he divorced her and told her that she would be safer if she went back to her family and you know gave her all his wealth. And she said, I'll go on condition that when you meet the prophet on the day of judgment, that you remember me, don't forget me when you meet. She had such a love for the prophet and his family that she was the one who was instrumental in Zuhair ibn Qayn joining Imam Hussein's army. And as we know, he was actually the commander of the right flank in Imam Hussein's army and one of the main people who was in charge of defending him against the arrows while he was praying. And that was all because of his wife, Dulham. The stand of Hussein did not just inspire Muslims, as is evident by the story of Umm Wahab, a devout Christian she not only encouraged her family to support Imam Hussein, but ultimately became the first female martyr in the land of Karbala. In 61 years after Hijra, Imam al Hussein was passing by and he asked, O people of this tribe, to which Um Wahab came out and spoke to Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein asked her, Where is your son? Imam al Hussein then struck the ground to which a river flow that is still available until today. He told her to tell her son that he would like to speak to him and that the dream of his is true. When her son returned that evening, she, he asked her where did this water come from? She advised him it is as if Jesus himself had come, struck the earth and water flowed. And she said that your dream is true. Her son was astonished. Wahab then cried out and said, mother I had a dream last night in which the spirit of Isa came to me. By him were men of nobility and dignity. And he informed me that this was Nabi Muhammad. And next to him was Amir al-Mu'mineen. Next to him was Imam Hussein. Prophet Isa then asked me that tomorrow there will be a war in Karbala and that I should be a part of this war. Wahab then himself went to Imam Hussein and proclaimed himself as a Muslim. He took his shahada under the hands of Imam Hussain. He was just newly wed. He was 22 days and newly married. And his wife was against him going to Karbala, going to the war. However, Um Wahab advised her son that no, you should go and you should fight. You should be of those that sacrifice themselves. But then all of a sudden, the wife started encouraging Wahab to fight. He asked her, what, made, what changed your mind? Why are you now telling me to fight? And she cried as she said, I looked at Sayyidah Zainab and I saw her standing there. And so I have to give up as much as she is giving up. So now she encouraged her husband to go. Um Wahab's husband and son were battling in the fight of Karbala. When her husband was martyred, she took the tent pole and she went towards the battlefield. She went to the head of her husband and she wiped away the dust. To what the opponents then said, go and kill this woman. She congratulated her husband on his martyrdom and God himself provided her with martyrdom. She was the first lady in Karbala to achieve martyrdom. One of the most heart-wrenching tragedies of the day of Ashura is the martyrdom of Ali al-Asghar, the young infant of Imam Hussein. The infant's mother and the wife of Imam Hussein, Rabab, was an incredible woman, a poet, a devotee, and a pious worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabab was the devoted wife of Imam al Hussein. She was someone that truly loved him and held him in the highest of esteemed positions. Reports tell us that Rabab was someone who was an incredibly intelligent woman, 
She was a beautiful woman. She was someone that was very devoted to the Ahlul Bayt and the message of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his progeny. Rabab, in fact, loved Imam Hussein so much that there's a poem that she wrote for him that's beautiful, that really commemorates the essence of Imam al Hussein, not as we know it, but as someone who was very dear to her heart as her beloved husband and her supporter. She was Rabab bint Imru al Qais, who was a great poet from the pre Islamic era who then converted to Islam, and she too composed poetry just like her father and was very intelligent. Narrations indicate that she was the mother of Ruqayya and uh, Ali Asghar or Abdullah al Radi. She was the one who offered her baby son to Imam Hussein, showing him his plight and that perhaps they could get a little bit of water for him, that perhaps the enemy's hearts weren't that hard that they could ignore the cries of a tiny baby, that perhaps, you know, they would be softened and just give him a little bit of water since her milk had dried up. But unfortunately, as we know in the story, the archer Harmala, when he went, someone who never missed his mark, actually missed his mark because of Rabab and how anxiously she was waiting for her baby to get water and standing from behind the tents watching that, you know, it, it unhinged him and he was, he kept missing his mark until finally he managed to make the target with his three-pronged arrow and shattered that mother's heart. There's a beautiful poem that Rabab composed that's heartbreaking in the memory of Imam al Hussein, where she writes, the one who was a beacon that everyone relied on for illumination was slain in Karbala and left unburied. O grandson of the Prophet, may God reward you with goodness on our behalf and may the scales of actions not be light. For me, you are like an unshakable mountain in which I found protection. He looked after us with mercy and religious conviction. Now, who is there for the orphans and who is there for the destitute? And who will give shelter to the impoverished and make them needless? I swear by God, I shall not desire to have another husband after you until I am covered between the sand and the earth. One cannot talk about the greatness of the women of Karbala without talking about Sayyida Zainab, the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib. A titan in her own right, she led the remnants of the caravan of Imam Hussein after his death as a mountain of patience, and with her tongue stood defiant in the courts of Ibn Ziyad and Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Sayyida Zainab's role in the Battle of Karbala was pivotal. Sayyida Zainab was able to recognize who was the Imam of her time. In a first sense, she was protecting Imam al Hussein. She was protecting him with everything she had, with own Muhammad. But upon his martyrdom, she then took it upon herself to protect Imam Zainab al Din, the next Imam of her time. She treated them like her commanders. At all times, her primary concern was the continuing of Islam. It's making sure that the message continued. And here Zainab has the trust of kissing the neck of Hussein and delivering her mother's last will and testament. But I think perhaps the most striking thing for me is when Zainab looks over and she sees that camp knowing that she's going to run to this tragedy, seeing the actual eyes of those who've committed one of the most heinous atrocities in human history. How was it that Zainab was able to see the manifestation of the human tragedy before her eyes and still be able to compose herself without losing her mind, without losing her soul, without giving in to these oppressors. How does any human being do that? 
accepting what God has willed. Sayyidah Zainab Salam's role after the burning of the tents was an incredibly important one. She was the protector of the widows, she had become the mother of the orphans, and essentially shielded Imam Zain al-Abidin from getting killed because she knew that Imam Zain al-Abidin was not just her nephew, he was the fourth Imam of the Ahlul Bayt and he was the continuance of the legacy of Islam itself. These tents that house these orphans and widows, all full of grief, are now in flames. And that it wasn't enough that they had taken and, and, and brutally murdered the family of the Prophet ﷺ, trying to cut off his lineage. But then to know that she is here having to galvanize, to galvanize to protect them. Her attention, again, in these moments where none of us would be able to even imagine the grief that we would carry to be able to have to pivot and immediately move from the grief of her brothers and her family members and what she saw in her children to the protection of the women and the orphans. And somehow in my own mind, I imagine that when she opened that cloak to protect those women and children and orphans and widows, that that is a symbolism that each and every one of us needs to embody, the ability to protect the marginalized. That's what she did. If it wasn't for Zainab, where would all of these women and children get their strength from? Her role in Karbala, as we know, she was Sharika Tul Hussein, but no less important in spreading the message of Imam Hussein than Imam Hussein himself. She raised the morale of everybody who was there. She was the one who looked after the women and children. She's the one who, when they were paraded from Kufa to Karbala to Sham and made to ride on saddleless camels and horses, she was the one who would get down and bury the little children who kept falling off and picking up the children who kept falling off. She was the one who had to have her eyes and ears wide open when Ibn Ziyad's courtiers were trying to take some of the younger ladies as, as slave girls. She was the one who, you know, had this dignified aura about her that made Ibn Ziyad tremble and made them everybody sit up and take notice because she was such a force to be reckoned with. One of the most remarkable things about Sayyidah Zainab salam's leadership is that she was able to strike this balance between processing her own trauma after witnessing the calamity that befell her and trying to console the women and children of the caravan of Imam Hussein salam. And this tells us that this demonstrates to us her competent leadership, but also her ability to be completely selfless in the pursuit of preserving the message of the Holy Prophet Most of us, when we hear of a tragedy, immediately we deny it. Our brain acts as a shock absorber to say, no, that did not happen. Zainab didn't have the luxury. The women of Karbala did not have the luxury of a stage of grief called denial. They were in Karbala, unfolding this tragedy with acceptance as their beginning, not as their end. So Zainab emerges again as this pivotal role for men and for women, and in human history, as perhaps one of the most valiant human beings that our human history has ever seen, has ever recorded, and will ever know. Zainab becomes not just the sister of Imam Hussein, and the daughter of Fatima and Ali, peace and blessings upon them. She becomes the mother of the orphans and the widows. It takes institutions to take care of orphans and widows. Zainab stands alone as a single human being who not only brought down an entire dynasty with her courage, with her eloquence, with her words, with her stature, but she single-handedly became the standing institution for the orphans and the widows of Karbala. How profound is that? What does that take in a human being to be able not only to see those whom you love, including your children, your siblings, your nephews, people who have surrendered themselves to take care of your family, to see them go through this human tragedy 
and to put everyone before herself. When we think of altruism, there is no one, at least that I know of, that I would say has the altruism of Zainab. When remembering the resolve of the women of Karbala, one cannot forget the young daughters of Imam Hussein, who bared the trials and tribulations of the day of Ashura and its aftermath with immense patience. Two of these young orphans were named Ruqayya and Sukaina. Sayyida Ruqayya, as sources mention, was the youngest daughter of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Sources mention that she would have been about four or five years old in Karbala, and she was very beloved to him. They say she used to love sleeping on the chest of her father. Sources mention that after Imam Hussein alayhi salam had been killed, the night that the camps were looted, she was beaten, she was slapped, her earrings were snatched away, and she was wandering about looking for the body of her father. Upon traveling all the way to Damascus, she continuously asked for her father. She wanted to be with him. When Yazid heard this young child cry for her father, he sent a platter in which looked as though it was for food. They placed it in front of her. She said, I'm not hungry at this moment. Upon which the slave then raised the platter and showed her that this was the head of her father. And it was at that very moment that she passed away from extreme grief to in shock towards seeing her father's severed head. Sukaina was the nine-year-old daughter of Imam al Hussein, who Imam al Hussein had named Tranquility. And incidentally, she lived up to become a source of tranquility for Imam al-Hussein. Sukaina was taken captive from Kufa to Damascus and back to Medina. And while she was in the court of Yazid, she rose up and rebuked Yazid and said, how dare you take the daughters of the Holy Prophet captives and prisoners. Sukaina was an incredibly beautiful and intelligent and dignified young woman who was regularly consulted by the elders of Quraysh. She was a narrator of a hadith of the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam, and she became known as a source of spiritual and religious knowledge for the women of Medina. Some say that Sukaina and Ruqayya were the same person, but some say that Sukaina actually lived on past Karbala and she was another daughter who was probably between 10 and 13 years old in Karbala and that she grew up to be a very intelligent, a very lettered woman who used to write poetry and used to encourage gatherings of knowledge and poetry. When Zainab stood before Ibn Ziyad and Yazid in their courtrooms, she gave speeches of defiance that shook the foundations of the Umayyad Empire. These speeches were the sparks that lit revolutions, ultimately toppling the Umayyad dynasty and leaving a ripple effect that leaves tyrants in fear until the present day. It was the first time in history that the Ahl al-Bayt, the progeny of Muhammad, al-Muhammad, were treated in a manner in which Sayyid Zainab was treated. When she was taken captive to Yazid, at no time in history were the progeny of al-Muhammad treated in this way. Yazid had expected that after all of the treacherous things that happened, after the burning of the tents, after the killings, that Sayyidah Zainab would somehow be broken, unable to speak. Yazid had silenced Imam Zain al Abidin, but he was not able at all to silence Sayyidah Zainab. She spoke in defiance for him. Sayyidah Zainab's sermon that she delivered in the court of Yazid, it's one of the most powerful sermons that you will find because she takes the opportunity, she raises her voice to be able to tell off the tyrant of the time, to be able to tell the situation and narrate to the people exactly what was and to narrate the fact he is so boastful of his victory in Karbala, of how he has decimated the family of the Prophet. And she puts him in his place and actually questions him the whole sermon is filled with rhetorical questions in the way she interrogates him almost and puts him in his place. Do you think you've got victory over the family of the Prophet? 
How can you sit here while your women are veiled and covered and you've uncovered our faces? How can you treat the family of the Prophet like that when he was the one who freed you? Yabna Tulaqa. Tulaqa were the freed captives during the conquest of Mecca. And the Prophet had the kindness to free these captives. So she calls him Yabna Tulaqa, which is actually a derogatory term. She curses the people of Sham for their ignorance of who they were. We know that Muawiyah's propaganda machine had made Imam Ali salam, out to be so bad that these people couldn't recognize that this was the family of the Prophet himself. And she reminds them, she reminds that whole courtroom of who they were and why they were there and how bad Yazid was. So she displays the dignity, the faith, the godliness of the family of the Prophet as their representative. It turned the hearts of the people at that time and it made the people realize how corrupt and evil Yazid had been and how he had hoped that this would kind of just be buried under the carpet when we know that it wasn't and the message continues to live on. When Sayyidah Zainab was asked, how do you see what happened to you and your family? Sayyidah Zainab replies, I see nothing but beauty. And this is very telling of the type of vision and conviction and lens that Sayyidah Zainab had on the events of Ashura. It tells us that Sayyidah Zainab was a, a very resilient individual, but more importantly, one that saw death and destruction and massacre and the loss of an incredible number of loved ones right before her eyes is something that was very relative to her. Death was relative to her because of more importance in her eyes was that of satisfying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that of the legacy of Islam, preserving the legacy of Islam. And so for Sayyidah Zainab when she says, I saw nothing but beauty, is, is something that is very inspiring, I think, to the average person to really reshift our focus and to think about our hardships and our difficulties in a way, in a way that Sayyidah Zainab saw. The woman of Karbala changes the course of history. If it were not for them, the message and the commemoration and the poetry that we have today would not exist. They provided us with them. They told us the stories. They changed and created emotion in the people around them, so much so that a new battle occurred after Imam Hussein. Yazid was so afraid at the sight of Sayyidah Zainab speaking to him because he knew that a revolution was going to occur. He tried everything to stop it. They showed us that death is not an end, but a means towards a new beginning. And that it's a Roman's role in society to be the one that uses the tongue, uses the emotion, uses their compassion to make a change. That she has so much more to contribute in her own sense if she was able to actually see a female's worth the way she designed up did in the day of Karbala. All together, this story has been validated for year upon year upon year upon year, and now into centuries, and it's not changed. The role of the women of Karbala was to be the storytellers. The survivors, but the storytellers. And this isn't something that we should take lightly. Imam al Hussein had entrusted them to disseminate the accurate narrative about what had occurred, what had transpired, on the plains of Karbala. It is thanks to them that until today, worldwide, there are majalis in the memory of Imam al Hussein, his companions, the family of Imam al Hussein, the elegies that we know, the historical details that we have. Prior to Karbala, we see ladies like Dulham, like Umm Wahab, encouraging their menfolk to stand with Imam Hussein alayhi salam, to join his caravan, to go and fight with him, to not be scared reminding them of the Akhirah, of the Prophet. During the battle, the women were instrumental in helping the wounded, nursing the wounded, encouraging their menfolk to go, helping them with their armor. And after the battle, we know that they were the primary sources of narrations that we have about the event that took place. We know that on their return to Medina, they established the Institute of Majalis, of commemoration, of Marthiya, and letting people know exactly what had happened to the family of the Prophet. I think it's our job, it's our responsibility to not only 
look to the women of Karbala for inspiration, but to really try to be like them, to try to emulate them, to try to hold them in a way that our decisions are made based on their courage, based on their strength, based on their ability to stand up against injustice. The story of the women of Karbala is one of defiance, an inspiration that will last until the end of time. Today, over 1,000 years later, millions walk to the grave of Imam Hussein in Karbala every Arba'in, offering condolence to him while also honoring the trials and the ultimate return of the women of Karbala to the grave of Imam Hussein.